All right, folks, uh, it's, it's 2.35, so I, I guess we'll get started. That's official uh, MIT time. Hopefully you guys are all in the right place. This is uh, 6838, which is uh, the shape analysis course. And I'm Justin, so I'll be your instructor for the day. Uh, if the class continues to be this size, I'll try to find an alternative space. I'm like not in love with this classroom anyway. Uh, uh, but we'll, we'll see uh, what happens. I think in graduate classes, there's usually a bit of attrition at the first uh, couple of weeks. But of course, I hope that that's not the case. All right, guys. Uh, so as usual, at the, at the beginning of the course here, we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time doing all the boring administrative stuff all right at the beginning. Uh, get that out of the way, and then we'll talk a bit about geometry. So our, our basic plan today is to have a little bit of an overview of some of the tools that we'll talk about in 6838. Uh, and then if there's time at the end of today's lecture, uh, we'll start on the next uh, set of slides and, and, and talk a bit about linear algebra and, and uh, something that you could consider to be math review, but I've tried to make it interesting even if you consider yourself to be a linear algebra ninja. Uh, right, so let's, uh, let's get started with some administrative stuff. Uh, I'm Justin, I'll be your instructor in 6838. Uh, my office is 32D460. Uh, you can find all this stuff online, incidentally. So that's on the fourth floor of the Stata Center in the D Tower. Fun fact, uh, the Stata Center has two towers, uh, and, and I'm in the D uh, one. Uh, and my office hours are, are 10 to 12 on Wednesdays, um, or by appointment. So if you, if you email me, I'm more than happy to find a time. I know you guys all have complicated schedules, and, and we'll see what we can do. Um, I am the PI of the Geometric Data Processing Group here at MIT. Uh, which, as you can imagine, is quite relevant to the, uh, the, the, the topic matter at hand uh, in 6838. Uh, your TA is Sebastian. Uh, Sebastian and I, you know, color coordinated for your ease of, of recognizing your, your course staff today. Uh, uh, and, and his office is right across the hallway from mine in uh, 475A, uh, with office hours Monday and Wednesday. Oh, well then let's fix that real quick. Um, so. There's Sebastian's email, which now has, in fact, a bold S. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I will update the slides online. Uh, right. If, if his, so uh, Sebastian is in one of these unfortunate grad student offices with a million people all in one kind of alcove, if that turns out to be uh, messy, uh, which I, I hope that it is, because I'm a big fan of you guys all engaging and showing up and doing all that cool stuff, uh, then uh, we'll, we'll find an alternative space. It's no big deal. OK? Uh, so, uh, the main uh, URL that matters for 6838 uh, is the one on the board. If you can't remember it or you don't feel like writing it down now, that's okay. Uh, if you just go to, if you even just search my name uh, or you remember gdp.csail.mit.edu, uh, it's on our list of courses there. Uh, and this is the web page that we're going to use to post all course material. Okay, so that includes uh, slides, including today's lecture slides, that includes the homeworks, project instructions, uh, schedule, all that good stuff is all, it's your one-stop shop. Um, for some reason, some MIT students are like totally programmed to find all of this stuff on Stellar. Um, that ain't where it is, because I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to use that. <laughs> okay, and I'm, I'm allowed, it's like I got a PhD just so I can do that. Uh, so, so in any event, um, that's, this is where I'm going to post stuff. Uh, if, if, you, if, you, if I get an angry note that you somehow didn't realize we had homework because you were looking on Stellar, uh, consider yourselves uh, warned. Uh, however, unfortunately, we will put your grades into Stellar just to keep things confusing. Um, uh, if you want to have course discussion, uh, the place to do it is on Piazza. How many of y'all have used Piazza before? Yeah, most of you. So, so there's a link on the course webpage. Um, please register and, you know, ASAP uh, to make sure you get all the announcements. You can send passive ag aggressive notes to your instructor, all, all the usual things that happen on these, these online uh, message boards. Okay? Um, any questions so far? Ah, good. Okay, fabulous. Uh, going through all of the boring stuff as quickly as possible. Uh, 6838 is a graduate course in computer science. I see no reason for you guys to have any exams. Um, I think it would be pretty rare to be held at gunpoint and asked to compute the curvature tensor of some manifold. <laughs> Um, so we're just not going to do that, uh, and instead uh, we're going to try and teach you guys how to be grown-up researchers, because I think that's a better skill. Uh, so there will be four homeworks in the class. Uh, homework one is already on the course webpage, so if you haven't started, you're officially behind. Uh, <laughs> and uh, essentially each homework will consist of some writing component, doing a little bit of math, 
Um, usually, you know, some kind of theme, you check some formula from geometry, you then code it up and see that it gets like a nice picture on your computer. Um, but really the main focus of, of 6838 is the course project, which is 40% of your grade. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Um, in addition to that, there are two smaller things designed to keep you guys on your, uh, your respective toes. Uh, the first uh, is bi-weekly nano quizzes. This appears to be an MIT phenomenon, these nano quiz things. Uh, so once every other week, um, there will be a short quiz at the beginning of class um, just on lecture material to, to keep you responsible. Um, the quizzes are designed to be easy. They will be multiple choice and you cannot make them up late unless there's like an issue, uh, you know, like a, uh, some specific reason you can't make class. Um, and all of those sorts of requests need to go through our S cubed office. So that's not a, at my discretion. Okay. Um, and then there's a new experiment in A38 this year. Uh, you can thank your TA for this additional uh, work here. Um, so every other week there'll be a nano quiz and then on the other, other week, uh, there will be a reading assignment. So essentially, uh, what we're going to ask is that you identify an interesting paper related to some of the material we've covered in class. We'll share a list of some suggested places, or if like, I know a lot of you guys are grad students in different departments, maybe you find a paper that's kind of adjacent to what you're interested in. Uh, you'll read a, write a quick paragraph on like what it's about and, and, and report a bit on some questions you have when you read it. Yeah? One of the important skills when you read research papers, whether they're at SIGGRAPH or ICML or whatever it is that architecture people will do, uh, which I think roughly covers 80% of people in this room. Um, uh, an important skill when you're reading these things is to realize that they're written by goofballs like me who make lots of mistakes and sloppy errors and leave information out and, and so on. Uh, and so when you read these things, I want you to really think critically and ask questions about like, well, you know, does their method of work as well as they advertise? What could go wrong? And, and, and you know, uh, think a little bit critically. Or if the writing is poor, you can complain about that. That's, that's fine. Okay, um, great. Uh, having fun yet? Okay, so, so, so the next thing, uh, your homework. You are allotted three late days. I know that there's some MIT courses that use like a weird generalized notion of day uh, in terms of course periods. That is not the case in 6838. These are periods of 24 hours from your homework due dates, which I believe are typically at 8 p.m. Um, you lose 25% per day beyond those three late days, and that is additive. It is not compound. That means after four days, you have a zero on your assignment. Um, and uh, you cannot use these things for your... your, your okay? So uh, uh, you consider yourselves uh, warned. Um, in this class, all components of this course are required to pass. Okay, so if, if you're trying to play like a percentage game, like this thing is worth like 18% of my grade and I think I can just not turn it in, uh, don't because you will fail, okay? <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Okay, and then finally, uh, your course project, uh, and, and I'm starting this all today right at the beginning, A, so that I don't have to talk about it again, and B, because I, this is a graduate course and, and I do really want you to start thinking about this from day one. Uh, the main sort of capstone in 6838 is a research project, uh, on your part. For those of you who took my, my undergraduate course, which is, is a fair number of you, um, this is considered a step up from that. Um, so in the undergrad course, I think I asked you to sort of identify an interesting technique that we didn't cover or maybe was related to something we covered and just code it up. Uh, in the graduate version of this, you're going to implement a relevant technique and extend it in an interesting way. Uh, and that's purposefully a little vague. So you can propose to take a technique from one field and apply it to another. Uh, you can, if you're a theory-oriented person, maybe you prove a slight you know, change to something that's inside of one of these papers that we read. Uh, maybe you do a benchmark and compare three different methods for the same problem against each other. You know, just something like that. Um, to show that you're, you're not just like typing in formulas, which is a pretty typical way to implement a paper in our field. They tend not to be too hard. Um, uh, but rather you're thinking critically about this stuff and, and doing something kind of cool. Uh, and unfortunately for you guys, my standards are pretty high. Uh, the last time I taught this class, the I think four papers uh, ended up as, as actually publications, which is pretty neat. Um, but we're here to help you guys out with that. Uh, so you have an engaged uh, set of course staff who, who more or less know, uh, you know different parts of geometry. Or if they don't, they should. And uh, uh, we're going we're gonna to help you in, in all the different stages and checkpoints here. Yep. So all the deadlines are on the website. Uh, and feel free to reach out uh, starting now with ideas, questions, thoughts, whatever. Um, speaking of the website, there's a schedule all the way to the bottom. This is an extremely fungible 
Is that the word to use here? Uh, schedule? Good, you, you, we got the English minor uh, uh, agrees. So, uh, right, so <laughs> essentially, uh, uh, right, the, the way that this course is going to work is that we're going to progress linearly through uh, topics, but of course, depending on, on how much airtime anyone takes, they might shift up and down. Um, what will not change are the other columns, which include the dates of the reading assignments, nano quizzes, and so on. Okay? Um, I know that a lot of you guys come from different departments, which is extremely cool. Uh, part of that means that if there are topics that you're really excited about in geometry world, let me know, and, and I'll, I will try to, to touch on them at least a little bit. Um, I say that, and then sometimes I get totally off the wall. Uh, responses of very specific tools in some area I've never heard of. Uh, so I reserve the right to ignore that advice, but I'll, I'll try to address at least a little or mention when things are, are, are kind of relevant. And one additional uh, thing that, that, that's kind of an experiment for this year uh, is that I'm attempting to stay ahead of you people in writing course notes to accompany this class. Uh, everybody repeat after me. The course notes are incomplete and messy. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to be very disappointed in you if I, I get a grumpy email that there's a typo. I know there are typos because I'm writing them as fast as I can uh, while, 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 while trying to teach this class. Um, but essentially, there's already a complete set of slides, so there will definitely be materials from day one to day N for, uh, for large N. Um, these are to accompany that, and my goal is for at least the first kind of half, two-thirds of the course uh, to have some written material to, to accompany this stuff. So there's a link uh, to a document on the course webpage. Um, they're going to change a lot because I'm like trying to write a textbook while teaching a course. Um, so what I would encourage you guys not to do is to print them out. Um, I've linked to this overleaf thing. So like anytime you click the link, it'll just recompile the document and show you the latest one. I know it's kind of a moving target and I apologize. I don't really know the best way to, to handle that sort of scenario. Um, but anyway, uh, the exciting thing uh, is this is an interesting opportunity for you all to uh, contribute to uh, what's essentially a course on a new research field. Uh, and as you encounter typos and mistakes and stuff, or, or just like, hey, it would be really great if you talked about this or, or you know, proved this in a way that wasn't incorrect, uh, feel free to you know, send that my way and I, I promise I can take it. I might send you a sarcastic response back, but that's just because you have that kind of instructor. Um, okay, uh, let's see here. Uh, your prerequisites are prerequisites. These are all listed in the course materials. Um, Things that I get questions about. If you haven't taken a computer graphics course, that's actually okay. Um, this class is listed as a graphics class uh, because I think officially I'm a member of the computer graphics group here at MIT. Um, the reality is graphics is like a bizarre research field that's really about 500 different things glued together. Um, and so essentially what we're going to be talking about in this class arguably could be computer vision, it could be learning, it could be graphics, it could be numerical methods. Uh, so it's just its own thing, um, and that's sort of optional. Um, what is not optional is calculus, <laughs> okay? Um, so we're going to try to build just based on undergrad level multivariable calculus. That means not just partial derivatives, but also, you know, integrals, right? Like that's, uh, like, and, and, and um, that's, a, that's, a, that's something that we're going to make use of starting in like day one, okay? So um, the first homework we have optimized to be a giant headache if you're not used to this kind of stuff. What that means is if you're a little frustrated, that's actually okay. Just reach out and, and, and ask for some help. The, the, actually, the problems are not complicated mathematically, but they do require digesting a lot of notation just to make sure that you're used to that kind of thing. Um, so if you're finding that you're totally stuck in writing a thousand pages of math, you're, you're doing it wrong. So, so just reach out and, and we're happy to help. It's, it's already up. You have 20 days to do it. It's, there's plenty of time, okay? Um, for those of you who took my undergrad class, you're in a world of trouble. It's a very different kind of, of problem set than, than what you're used to. Um, right. Uh, this is a relatively new class. For those of you who are PhD students here, it counts as a TQE um, in the AI category. Uh, we can have a philosophical discussion as to whether uh, the class uh, really is AI or not, but that's, I'll, I'll save that for another day. Um, but essentially, uh, this is, uh, I'm, I'm trying to uh, give you guys material that you're excited about. So anytime that, that you have suggestions, thoughts, ideas, just let me know. Um, that's fine. And essentially, in case you haven't figured out by now, the philosophy is that like, I'm really excited to teach this. This is a class on my discipline. I like to share these kinds of things. It's way more interesting than like, the boring service classes I have to teach. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, you know, 
out of enthusiasm, I'll design assignments and things to be interesting, but what's interesting to me might be terrifying to you. Um, so if that's the case, there's good probability that your instructor simply got a little over enthusiastic and wanted you to like prove some theorem and step through all the steps and didn't realize that like, you know, this is really enlightening if you're like a step away 50 feet, but that's hard to do if you're seeing it the first time. Uh, so just reach out. Uh, we'll, we'll be pretty generous with our support. Our, our goal isn't to, to punish you guys. Okay. With that, I'm done with all of the kind of boring, high-level, uh, meta class stuff. Are there any uh, questions about how 6838 works? I think it's pretty standard. Yes? One thing I noticed, it said Julia or Yes, sir. What's your thoughts on Python? My thoughts on Python. Uh, so the last time I taught this course, it was in Python. Um, it was a disaster, but not, not Python's fault. But that's not a long story. Um, so I think the deal is that your assignments are going to have starter code in those two programming languages. Um, you're welcome to do it in Python. I think it's fine. Um, yeah. Um, the, where I ran into some sticky points in Python is that we are going to need to render some stuff. Uh, and, and the support for that wasn't great, but that was a couple years ago. Maybe it's better now. I don't know. Um, in terms of your final project, I couldn't care less, and I don't want to see your code. <laughs> okay? Uh, this is where we're going to be grown-ups here. It's the same way, like, if you look at a research paper in our field, it's not like they have an appendix with, you know. Um, so for that, we're going to look at your results. Uh, so if you like Python, that's great. Um, Julia is a, a bit of an experiment. That's actually not a programming language that I know, uh, but at the strong encouragement of my colleagues in, in my department, we're, we're going to give it a try. <laughs> uh, so uh, Sebastian was kind enough to, to implement the homework in Julia, and it appears to work, so <laughs> we'll see. Uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, these are all great. The key uh, uh, machinery that we're going to need a lot of is sparse uh, linear algebra, um, which I know is supported in MATLAB, Python, Julia, C, C++, Fortran, if you're into that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> so uh, all of those are perfectly fine, and, and you should use whatever you're comfortable with. However, if you want help in my office, <laughs> uh, I would strongly encourage uh, one of the two uh, languages that are in the assignments. Uh, in particular, I've been using Julia for the last or MATLAB for the last 20 years, Julia for the last 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, but we'll get there. <laughs> Excellent question. Uh, any others? Yes. Is RTA super OG and Julia then? Is your, your, okay. is your TA a super OG? Okay. 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 He's the super okay at most things. <laughs> That's an odd phrase. Uh, <laughs> and even, I, would, I would even venture to say more than that on a few things. Uh, okay, any, any other uh, questions? Fabulous. Okay, uh, a quick survey for, for, for my purposes. Um, how many of you guys are undergrads? It's okay, we like you. Uh, 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 math student, or MEng rather. <laughs> uh, cool, uh, uh, PhD students. Great, so it's about an even split, um, so this is pretty normal. Uh, in terms of background, EECS, uh, math, uh, engineering, architecture, uh, business, uh, English, Spanish <laughs> literature. No, okay, great. Uh, fabulous. So that's, that's more or less what I would have guessed, and it's pretty uh, normal for this class. Uh, for the undergrads among you, uh, this may be your first graduate class. If you need help learning how to study and do all that kind of stuff, that's great. Come to my office. I like to talk about those things. I like to talk about most things. Okay. Uh, great. So that ends all of the uh, administrative stuff on, on my list. And, and finally, we can, we, can, we can talk geometry. Sound good? Fabulous. Okay. So in uh, 6838, uh, uh, the way that I sort of have thought about the contents of this class is that you can kind of parse the name of, you know, of, of, of sort of what I put on our, 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 our extremely incomplete sloppy uh, textbook in two different ways, right? Uh, and, and one of the interesting things that we see a lot of in the computer science world is that geometry tends to be kind of a sub-discipline in a lot of different fields, right? Like there's architectural geometry, there's geometry for computer graphics, there's manifold learning and machine learning, there's, I don't know, what are some of the other ones? Uh, uh, 3D computer vision. All of these things are applying 
essentially the same hammers to different nails, right? And, and so for whatever reason, just historically speaking, you know, geometry has always kind of played second fiddle uh, to an application area, at least in computer science. Of course, if you're in math, uh, the story is quite different. Um, so in this class, our goal is to kind of grab ideas from all of these different disciplines, which often are thought of as quite disjoint, and, and bring them together into to one um, extremely disorganized picture. Okay, so, so, so the basic way to, to kind of parse this is on the one hand, we'll talk about the analysis of geometric data, right? Many of us uh, are in the computer vision world. You're used to seeing 3D models, whether it's in, in computer-aided design or LIDAR, what have you. Uh, and we'll talk about the type of machinery that you need to understand a shape and why that's not as simple as just, you know, splatting it onto an image grid and, 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 and doing 2D uh, style processing. Um, but at the same time, we'll also uh, grab some ideas that are geometric in nature, but apply to data analysis problems. Right? So if you guys have taken uh, a class in graph theory or in manifold machine learning and so on, all of these things use geometric terminology quite a bit. Right? I mean, they talk about proximity, similarity, uh, even some very specific stuff like Laplacian operators, manifold structure, and so on. And yet we very rarely join them together with like these low dimensional problems where we can just look at it and, and, and build some intuition. Yeah? And so that's our goal here, is, is to kind of treat both of these things in parallel. Uh, and what that means is if you look at the list of papers that we'll be kind of referencing and talking about, they're going to be drawn from all over the place. And often, often we'll use quite different language and, and motivating applications, even though at the end of the day the machinery will be quite similar. Okay, so that's, that's the message that we're going to kind of try to have from a high level, although at the same time, you know, we're going to be taking a scenic route and, and looking at a lot of different uh, motivating reasons why you want to think about uh, geometry problems. So today I thought I'd highlight some of the fun sort of high level ideas in the applied geometry world, uh, including some of the theoretical toolbox that we have at our disposal, um, some of the computational machinery out there that's relevant to understanding shape uh, in the applied context, and then finally, a little bit of the application areas, all of which benefit from these first two things. Yeah, so this will mostly be just a picture book today. We'll look at some nice images of shapes, <laughs> which is always a fun thing to do in a geometry class. Uh, and then time permitting, we'll, we'll get started and, 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 and talk about Einstein notation and subscripts and all that terrible stuff. Okay? Um, I like to, you know, that's, uh, we start easy and then you hit you with the, the sledgehammer and do uh, the hardest stuff first. Okay? So let's first uh, talk a little bit about the theoretical toolbox. I think something that we neglect in the computational world a little bit is that there's really this rich theory of geometry that extends beyond Euclid. Um, and and the, you know, the, the stuff that you learn in, in high school or, or undergraduate uh, in terms of geometry is just the tip of the iceberg. And in fact, there are so many interesting tools and constructions that make perfect sense in the applied context and aren't just triangles. Yeah? Uh, and, and so one of the kind of fun things that, that we'll do a lot of in this class is be talking about these high-level 20th century ideas in geometry, but then at the end of the day, we still got to make it work on a big you know, pile of messy points that's on our computer. Uh, and, and, and so we have to have one foot in, in the, the air and one foot on the, on the ground. Does that analogy work? Whatever. Okay. So probably where most of you guys uh, left off, unless you're in the math department, uh, is, is geometry that looks something uh, like what I've shown you here. Uh, this is Euclid's elements. I venture, I forget, but one of these images is from the original edition, and, and most of them are from, from later ones. Uh, this is the most uh, sort of famous, uh, actually I guess obviously not the original edition, because that would be, I think, before they had things like editions. Uh, but uh, uh, this is one of the most replicated books. Uh, largely because people like to have it on their shelf, but, but secondarily because there's some really uh, interesting uh, insight, of course, in terms of all of the cool things that you can do with essentially, what, a compass and a straight edge, right? And so when you talk about uh, uh, geometry in high school class, it's largely just an excuse to teach you guys how to write a proof, right? And, and so you start with a few axioms about angles and circles and all that good stuff, and, and you build up geometric theory and, and draw lots of diagrams uh, like what's shown in, in uh, Old English and Arabic and, and whatever your favorite uh, language is for this sort of thing. So I think there's an interesting feature uh, that leads most high school geometry kids to drop out of math shortly thereafter, uh, which is a shame. Uh, and I've highlighted it here on the slides, uh, which is what? Do these uh, look like interesting shapes? 
No, right? This is like the most least interesting geometry. I mean, you know, the the, the point, of course, that the, the Euclid is making is that there's a lot of elegance and simplicity and, and, and such. But of course, the reality uh, in in our world is that our data looks something more like uh, what I've shown you on the slide here. Right? This is some, I believe, a lidar scan of a bridge, uh, and it's not a hundred percent clear, at least to me, how. Well, it's probably somewhat clear to me, but hopefully less so to you guys, how you might transition uh, uh, from, from you know, images that look like this uh, to analyzing data that looks like that. Right? And so the lucky thing for us is that Euclid happened how, how many years ago? I feel like you would know this kind of thing. Many, many years ago. Uh, and, 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 and thankfully, uh, that isn't the beginning and end of, of the geometric uh, story, even if your you're, you're, you know, high school uh, education kind of stops there. And in fact, to make matters worse, of course, uh, I think we would all recognize that, that processing this type of data is, is pretty much a geometric task. In some sense, that's all the information you have. Um, but, but one of the sort of interesting insights, which appears time and time again in the machine learning world, uh, whether they're, they're willing to admit it or not, uh, is that even when you're understanding things like big uh, data sets, which don't you know, look like shapes, um, there's geometric structure hiding inside of there, right? Um, so this is our favorite MNIST handwritten uh, digit thing. Um, one of the, our, our favorite things to do to this data set is to try and like embed it in the plane, right? And sort of have nearby digits kind of have similar structure, for instance. So I've, I've read a countless number of, of research papers who, that, that start this way. Hopefully they apply to more interesting data than this. I'm told that the easiest way to get your research paper rejected in machine learning is to, to, to apply it to this data set. Um, Okay, so, so in our course, what we're going to try and do is, is fill in a lot of the gaps. Okay, uh, and so we'll start uh, in this class uh, moving away from Euclidean geometry and into another discipline called differential geometry. I'm just out of curiosity, do any, does any of you guys recognize these textbook covers? These are some of the most famous math textbook covers. Uh, this is, like as you can see here, it's by Spivak. Uh, he also has a good calculus book that, that people uh, uh, neglect. Um, it's extremely kind of hippie. Uh, treatment of, of, of differential geometry. Uh, I love it. If you, if you read the introduction to the first book, he talks about how he set out to write the Great American Differential Geometry textbook. Something about that phrase really stuck with me. Uh, but in any event, um, Spivak, Spivak was able to fill five volumes worth of material about understanding a shape that isn't a triangle. Um, obviously, uh, the corollary here is that we will not cover uh, most of the things that Spivak does, but the lucky thing is that what takes him about 80 pages will often take us about five minutes and a hand wave. Um, because we're less concerned in this class with, with some of the really low level proofs in, in differential geometry and more kind of understanding the high level stuff. So if you take a differential geometry course, how many of you have? I'm guessing a few, yeah. Um, essentially you'll spend most of your time, at least the undergrad level, uh, looking at objects and diagrams that look a lot like these things. This uh, object is, is a surface, and more generically, uh, a manifold. Uh, the term manifold gets thrown around a lot in computer science um, as <laughs> a thing with some geometry associated to it. Uh, people rarely check that their data actually satisfies any assumption that makes it a manifold, and that's the thing that we'll do uh, two lectures from now. Um, but in any event, a manifold is sort of this generic notion of what it means to be a geometric figure uh, in the differential geometry sense. Right? So the big high-level development that Gauss and, and other people had in the discrete, or yikes, <laughs> ahead of myself, the, the, the differential geometry world, uh, is that you can take these neat tools that were developed for calculus and apply it to shapes. Right? And it's not 100% obvious how to do that. Right? I mean, calculus is, is all about derivatives and, and areas and so on. A shape is the sort of object that sits in space, but if you like, move it around and deform it, maybe it doesn't change all that much. Uh, and so, essentially, the theory of differential geometry is all about how to do the sort of accounting to deal with that fact, that what you care about is not a function, right? In calculus, you talk a lot about integrating, differentiating functions. But in differential geometry, you talk about a set of points that sit in R3, right? And there's a little bit of transition that has to happen there to understand that, that, that these things are, are not quite the same. Yeah, so we'll start in our course by just talking about one-dimensional manifolds. These things are also called curves. Uh, if you look at your first problem set, which is already online, you'll see that it does a little bit of calculations on curves to get, you know, kind of a geometry warm-up and to use confusing notation, just to give you a headache. Um, incidentally, you can already do, I think, the first two-thirds of this thing. Um, like, it's, it's basically just calculus. 
uh, and then the last little bit will require some material in the next uh, few lectures. Uh, right, so the, the basic notion of a manifold, in case you haven't seen it, is a manifold, uh, as a piece of geometry, is a set of points. It's not a function. Yeah, it's not like an f of x, you know, like a, a function from the plane into a surface, but it is a set of points sitting in some space. Yeah, and then the manifold assumption sort of says that locally, if I grab a point, then I can draw a little, you know, ball around it, so that locally it looks like a uh, Euclidean space. Right? Remember, Euclidean space is Rn. Yeah? So in other words, there's a set of points, so for example, a surface, which is a two-manifold, it's really a sub-manifold of R3, we'll come back to that later, as a set of points in R3, so that if I take any point, then there exists a function into the surface that kind of parameterizes around that point. You don't have to write all this stuff down, this is just high-level story and we're going to fill in a lot of details later. But the big development in differential geometry is that this gives you a little toehold into applying calculus to understanding shape. Because now I have a function, right? Around every point I have a function that maps into the surface and I can compute its derivatives and, and, and understand this object as a proxy for the shape that's sitting in 3D. That makes sense? So then the notion of, of manifold and shape, of course, extends beyond surfaces to all kinds of other objects, right? So a curve is a one-dimensional manifold. Surface is a two-dimensional manifold. Starting with three manifolds, it's kind of hard to render, uh, uh, but, the, but they exist uh, nonetheless, right? Uh, so can anybody think of a good example of a, of a smooth three manifold? The set of rotations is a good one. Right? You have roll, pitch, and yaw. Those are three parameters. So it's like a three-dimensional object. Uh, and, and, and essentially what we'll see is that the same theory that we're applying to these 2D objects uh, will apply in, in, in that case as well. Yeah? Can anybody think of a good high-dimensional manifold that shows up in, in computational world? There are many. Ah, you're killing me, guys. If you haven't noticed, I'm going to keep asking questions. This is a thing. And I, and I reserve plus or, or minus five points on your grade uh, for participation. Yeah, so one, one good one is in robotics, uh, so in, in configuration spaces, right? Uh, how many of us know this term? So in configuration space on a robot would be like, for example, the list of all the joint angles, right? So then you have the product of a bunch of manifolds, like maybe a circle if you have a one-dimensional angle, and it's, you know, SO3 for like a 3D kind of ball joint, you know, all glued together into one big high-dimensional object. Yeah? And so this is the kind of language that you really need to, to talk about that kind of stuff in a formal way. So once you've defined objects like Manifold, there's so many cool things that you can do. Uh, and these are really the beginning of most of the computational techniques that we have at our disposal as well. Right? So just uh, to continue in our picture book, uh, sort of the next topic that we'll talk a lot about in 6838 is curvature. Uh, this is particularly important, for, well, in the computational world, it's particularly important in the two-dimensional case, right? understanding surfaces. Uh, so people in architecture, computer-aided design, spend a lot of time computing and understanding curvature on a surface, which is roughly a measure of bendiness. Uh, here I've shown you two species of curvature, K and H. Anybody know what these two things stand for? K stands for... Uh, the principal curvatures are kappa 1 and kappa 2 here. And the product of those two things, Gaussian curvature, yep, K stands for Gauss, and H, Mean curvature. Yeah. If you don't know that, that's fine. We're going to cover all this stuff in, in detail. Um, but you can see they sort of, uh, well, on a torus, they kind of capture the same thing, which is that, you know, the torus is kind of flat here and kind of curved there. Um, although the sign of these things is different. Yeah. Because um, what we're going to see is that Gaussian curvature is going to distinguish this inner part of the torus, the donut, right, which kind of looks like a saddle from the outer part, which is kind of curved inward, right? It's kind of like a parabola. Uh, and, and we'll formalize that. Uh, curvature shows up all over the place. One of my favorite examples is in car design. So people in, in designing cars are extremely sensitive to the smoothness of the curvature function along the side of the car. Apparently something that people really care about when they buy a car, which was news to me, is the reflections that they see off of the side. People really don't like curvature discontinuities, which are literally reflected in the geometry. Uh, and, and so actually, if you look at the software tools for, for designing uh, these sorts of 3D models, what they'll do is they'll like put a little stripe pattern over here and kind of reflect it off the side of the car so that you can see little kinks in the stripes anytime the curvature is messed up. Uh, yeah, so anyway, we'll talk about how to measure this on a triangulated surface. One of the really interesting things, this is a totally unambiguous story in the college level differential geometry 
world. Like if you take a class over in the math department, you'll learn these nice formulas. One thing is what we'll see here is that there's already no consensus among <laughs> me and my colleagues on how to measure these things on, on even a triangle mesh. Uh, there are a lot of different techniques and, and they all have different positive and negative. And that'll be our first example of a big theme theoretically in geometry world, uh, which is this idea of a no free lunch theorem. Uh, so the, the basic idea of no free lunch is that there are oftentimes these beautiful constructions in smooth geometry that just don't work in the co computational case. In other words, that if I want one Laplace operator with the following 10 properties that are all true in the smooth one, you've got to choose eight. <laughs> uh, and that you can prove that you can't satisfy all 10, which is really depressing. Uh, but it actually, in a sense, uh, motivates some interesting engineering, right? Because what it means is that it might be that, like, my Gauss curvature is different from the Gauss curvature that Leanne is using, and that's for good reason, you know? Uh, and, and, and those are some things we'll talk about as well. Of course, differential geometry toolbox has all kinds of other fun things. Uh, one of the big ones that we'll talk about is computing distances. I have, have, have learned Dijkstra's algorithm in an in a algorithms class. A lot of, ah, that's a more familiar one. Um, so there's an interesting question. Let's say I give you this bunny here. This bunny is composed of a few thousand triangles. And I ask for the shortest path from one point to another along the bunny, but constrained to move along the surface. Now this is called a geodesic. So, uh, you know, if you know Dijkstra's algorithm, you can say, okay, well, the bunny is a, a graph of sorts, right? It's a bunch of vertices connected by edges. Yeah, and, and so maybe I construct this object and I say, okay, well, a reasonable approximation, my colleague Keenan gives me a hard time for drawing vertices that aren't degree six. Um, in any event, uh, uh, let's say I want the shortest path from here to here. Maybe a reasonable approximation is like the shortest path on the edges of this object. How do I think this is a good approximation? How do I think, well, Justin's asking this question, so the answer is probably no. Yeah, the answer is uh, this is actually not convergent. Let me give you a counterexample real quick. Uh, so let's say that I take a square, one of my favorite objects, personally, and I put a triangle mesh on it like this. It seems innocent. Um, and now I, let's say I compute the shortest path from here to here. Maybe this is the unit square. What's the length of that path? Ah, finally, they participate. Square root of two, yeah. <laughs> if you don't know that, then, then this class may not be the right one for you. Uh, however, uh, what is the shortest path from this corner to this corner? Two. Do you see that? Because there's no diagonal edge here. I have to move, they have to do like Pac-Man. <laughs> yeah? Uh, here's the thing. You might say, well, that's an approximation error. Yeah, this is just because I don't have enough triangles. Is that true? No, I can make this pattern as dense as I want, and the distance from here to here will always be two. That's a problem. Yeah? And so we'll talk about essentially extensions of Dijkstra's algorithm, including a technique called fast marching that lets you do that. <laughs> right? And it turns out that that's easy to draw and not so easy to code. Um, because, like, okay, well, what if I have a path from here to here? Well, now it's got to cut across a bunch of triangles, and, and you can see how this is going to get tough quickly. When we talk about distances, we'll also talk about uh, inverse problems in distances that appear in the machine learning world. Uh, so if you've ever heard the term manifold learning, uh, it's largely a lie. Uh, but, but that aside, um, the manifold learning world is all about thinking of your data set as some low dimensional object cutting through some very high dimensional space. Right? So maybe I take everybody in this classroom, I measure their height, their weight, their, their eye color, well, probably not their eye color because it's not a real number, um, their blood pressure, their, the length of their hair, oh, whatever. And I, you know, these are very high dimensional data points. Right? But the fact is that you guys all kind of cluster together and maybe there's like a one or two dimensional kind of family of, 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 of parameters that really matter in, in your data. Right? And, and these techniques are all about kind of finding, uh, extracting that kind of information and then using it uh, to your advantage. Right? Because there are a lot of algorithms that scale poorly in dimension and the thought is maybe you can do better by using the intrinsic dimension of your data instead of the extrinsic one. If these are not terms you've heard before, that's okay. So extrinsic means like the space that you're sitting in, and the intrinsic means like you know, the, the actual dimensionality here. So for instance, if I have a surface sitting in R3, what do you think the extrinsic dimension would be? Three, right? Because it's sitting in 3D. But what's the intrinsic dimension? Two, yeah, because the surface locally looks like a little sheet of paper. Yeah? Okay. 
Some other fun things we'll talk about in this class include vector fields. Uh, this is a topic that you probably haven't seen a lot of in your, your calculus class. Um, so now I'm going to have the pleasure of having to teach you the smooth theory and the discrete theory in, in, in parallel, which is fine. Um, but vector field design shows up all over the place, especially in the computer graphics world, uh, for practical tasks like covering the bunny in zebra stripes. Right? So here, uh, the question is, if I have a 3D, the bunny will show up a lot today, by the way. Uh, if I have a 3D model, you know, and maybe an artist places a few kind of guidance in terms of where to place this pattern, can I fill it in on the rest of the surface? Right? And this is an important problem, not just in computer graphics, uh, for, for topics like, like, you know, I don't know, designing hair is a big one. It's not very relevant to my life. Uh, but uh, that aside, there are also some, some interesting problems in architecture, right? So uh, one of the big questions that, that people in architecture ask is, and, and these people are in my office a lot, where they have these crazy, weird-shaped buildings. <laughs> and the first question is, will it stand? And once they've, they've figured out that that's probably true, the second one is, okay, how do I cover it in windows? Uh, and, I, you know, the problem with windows is that they're, like, square and flat. Uh, and so implicitly, the sides of the window form a little, you know, kind of pair of axes. And these axes have to kind of move smoothly along the surface. And so there's some directionality associated to that. And what we'll see is that exactly the topology and the kind of connectivity you get of a bunch of windows joined together on a surface uh, is going to look a lot like, you know, putting those zebra stripes on a bunny. It's going to look a lot... Uh, like some of the shortest path flow problems we, we see on graphs. All of these things are connected together. Is this fun? I love this stuff. Okay. From there, uh, we're going to talk about some partial differential equations. You'll see in this class, one of the fun advantages of A38 is that we're going to also touch upon a lot of other kind of numerical tools that show up in other fields. Uh, how many of you have heard the phrase, can you hear the shape of a drum? It's a very famous phrase in mathematics. So there's a question posed maybe 50, 75 years ago um, uh, by a mathematician. I think he had an MIT affiliation, actually, but I'm not 100% sure of that. I always say that, but I never Google it. He was an MIT professor, right? Um, so we asked the following question, which is, I look away from a 3D shape, and I hit it, and I observe the sound that it makes. Yeah? So I get a list of frequencies that come back. And the question was, do I know the shape if I, if I know that audio clip? And initially, this sounds like a little ridiculous, right? I mean, the audio clip is kind of a one-dimensional signal, and this is like a three-dimensional object. But actually, there is a beautiful link between geometry and, and audio or vibration or physics, whatever you want to call it. Um, and it's one of the principal computational tools that people use in modern geometry processing toolkit. What they'll do is they'll literally compute, here you can see the frequency spectrum on a 3D surface. And then they'll use that list of numbers uh, as a distinguishing uh, way to understand a surface. As a motivating example, um, so I play the cello uh, poorly, uh, and, and it's actually a, a great example of, of, of hearing the shape of an object. Right? If you've ever seen a cello or violin, you know they have strings, I hope. And when you play it, how do you, how do you play the instrument? Well, you put your finger down on the string, right? that effectively shortens the string, and then when you drag your bow along, the pitch changes. Okay, so think about that for a second. I changed the length of the string, that's a geometric thing, and the audio that I observed that came off of the string modulated. Yeah? So I can actually go, I can solve that inverse problem, right? If I hear the tone, I can tell you the length of the string on the cello. So it's actually not obvious whether you can hear the shape of a drum or not. How many of us vote yes? Well, you're wrong. Uh, it turns out there are shapes that are, are isospectral, but they're quite rare. Um, then one of the fun things that we'll talk about is that there's a parallel theory in the world of graph theory. And so once we develop all these cool ideas about surfaces, we'll see it's immediately applicable to like, understanding social networks. Uh, and that it's exactly the same machinery people use in areas like semi-supervised learning. Um, right. So that'll kind of exhaust our basic uh, picture of differential geometry. Uh, and then we'll start grabbing some ideas from other areas. And we're going to get fuzzier and fuzzier and more hand-wavy the, the farther we go into this class, because these are all the tips of like, their own graduate courses in the math department. So our job in this class is mostly to operate at this level of drawing pictures. Um, one of the really great philosophical developments in the geometry world was proposed by Riemann. At least he's the guy associated to it. How many of us have heard of Riemann? Yeah? Uh, so, so, so this Riemann asks this sort of an interesting question. Let's say I show you the globe. <laughs> yeah? And I, I show it to you like this, this math projection here. 
So the map itself, like the sheet of paper that's displaying the globe, that's a, that's a piece of geometry, yeah? Is it the globe? Is it, does it have the geometry of the Earth? No. I, I, I hope we can agree, but uh, at the same time, it does sort of capture some interesting relationships here, right? In particular, it captures topology, right? Like, if, if I want to know whether I can go from Africa to Florida, hopefully I'm not embarrassing them. Yeah, yep, that's right. Uh, <laughs> I notice that I can do it by drawing a path here. So what can I do is I can notice that the, a path exists. What can I not do is measure its length. Right, if I took a ruler and said, okay, so the shortest path from, from, from Africa to Florida is, is, is about 15 inches, I think we could all agree that that would be a fairly inaccurate estimate. Yeah? So the idea of Riemannian geometry is that we should decouple these two things. So we have a topological object, like this map here, which we can use whatever our favorite representation is. And then on top of that, we can put a geometric structure, like how to measure distances and angles and so on, and those don't have to be the same. Right? In other words, if I take... Believe it or not, this is not the same line segment displaced, right? One of these is much longer than the other, uh, and, and that's because you have to measure their length relative to the map on which they sit. It sounds dumb when I describe it this way, but if you open a Riemannian geometry textbook, I think it's actually quite easy to lose that point. Um, uh, you know, when you, just, you say, okay, you know, page one is like symmetric tensors, yeah? But this is really all that's going on. Um, Riemann's uh, perspective uh, is actually deeper than that, of course, and the idea is it's all of the, the, the geometry that you can do as an ant. Yeah? I guess ant if you have an ant friend and a piece of string. Uh, right? And so the idea is, for instance, if I want to sense curvature on a surface, I don't need to do too many crazy things, right? I can, I can hold Sebastian's hand, as I like to do on the way out of the office, and as we walk along a curved surface, if it's positively curved, we'll get closer together. If it's negatively curved, we'll get farther apart. Um, thankfully, we can test all of these things out in this data center fairly easily. Um, and uh, uh, that these are all things that, that the ant can do without having to like, look far away along the horizon, right? It's just little differential stuff but it's already enough to sense certain species of curvature. Yeah? Uh, in fact, there's a theorem by Gauss that you can uh, sense half of the curvature of a surface this way, and the other half you need to be able to look away from the surface. Yeah? You need to be less of an ant and more of a... What's a small thing with a head that can look up? Um, uh, I don't know. Okay. Right. Uh, in terms of some other fun areas that we'll touch on just a little bit, one of them is geometric mechanics. I mentioned this before a little bit. Right, so for instance, if I look at this double pendulum, there are two ways to understand it. There's the 3D picture. If you took my undergrad graphics class, you guys simulated a double pendulum and you did it using like points in 3D. The other is to notice what's really describing the system is like two angles, right? The angle of this guy up here and the angle of this guy down there, right? So in a sense, the geometry of this physical system isn't just points in 3D, it's actually a torus. Do you see that? It's the product of an angle here and an angle there. So if I had a point on this donut, I could go backward from that to a configuration of this double pendulum. Yeah? So there's a beautiful connection between physics and geometry, right? I can understand Newton's laws as tracing out paths on this, double, on this torus here, uh, and, and, and that that's a completely equivalent way uh, to simulating this, this torus object. And this is extremely valuable in the simulation world for a number of reasons. In fact, on your first homework, you'll implement uh, one model for discrete curves that already uh, kind of leverages this structure. So one of the big challenges, if you took uh, 6837, when you simulated this pendulum, how did you do it? You had two very stiff springs that were attached with a joint right here. And, you know, maybe you wanted the, even if the pendulum were inextensible, like, like it's not really a spring, it's just a stick, that's okay, like there's still a physical system with a degree of freedom. But what happened to the simulation? It exploded, right? Because you have a very stiff spring, it wants to vibrate really quickly, and that's not so good. Yeah? And so ideas from, from geometric mechanics say, well, if I just write physics down on this piece of geometry, I can never leave it, right? I can't extend this spring if I wanted to, yeah? And so simulating over here can often give you a much more accurate physical picture of the world with far fewer computation uh, than what you would have to do using the obvious coordinate system. And it reveals some of the interesting structure that's hiding in these problems. Some other fun tools we'll talk about include metric geometry. So this is like geometry when you don't have a derivative. Right. You just have a distance function. This shows up a lot in machine learning world. Right. So like, we'll talk about taking a high dimensional data set and embedding it in a low dimensional space. Right. Data visualization, people care about this a lot. Sadly, your computer screens are largely two dimensional. 
uh, uh, but data sets tend to be higher dimensional than that. We'll talk about one field which is close to my heart, um, Sebastian's by proxy, uh, <laughs> which is uh, the, the world of optimal transport, uh, which uh, attempts to weaken things even more and say, maybe I have a probability distribution over a piece of geometry. What can I say about it? Uh, in that case, while well, incor incorporating some ideas from uncertainty. And then if we weaken our structure completely, maybe geometry goes away and we just have topology left, which is just sort of the science of how stuff is connected together. Yeah? Uh, and, and so I'm offering to cover a little bit from the, the computational topology world. If we do, it'll be at the very end of this course, because a lot of these constructions are, are a little hairy and, and I don't want to lose all of you guys. Um, but we will see some topological constructions through this, this class. So, one of the topics that will come up about midway into A38 is a very popular tool in the computer graphics world called discrete exterior calculus. Personally, it's popular because it has like kind of a legit sounding math name, but it's really not that bad. Um, so, so discrete exterior calculus is going to build up some notion of topology on a triangle mesh uh, and, and show that it's useful for applications A while preserving uh, mathematical structure uh, at the same time, which is pretty neat. Okay. So there's your whirlwind tour of all the theory of geometry out there. Obviously, we're not going to cover any of these disciplines in any detail at all. But my hope is that you'll come out of this class with some intuition for what do these people think about? What are the key issues in, in these kinds of disciplines? And when I read a research paper in these fields, how do I extract the key message from the like scary math part that I can skip because I'm a pie person? Okay. Um, at the same time, there's all kinds of neat computational tools that we're going to apply to actually realize these geometric theories in practice. One of the fun things we'll do here is actually get our hands dirty and, 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 and try these things instead of just proving a bunch of theorems. Uh, and thankfully, there's a lot of, of tools at our disposal to do that. Um, so to start, of course, there's about a million different notions of shape that we encounter every day uh, in, in the computational world. Uh, probably the most famous of these things are triangle meshes, right? big piles of triangles that you see in computer graphics. But I would argue shape shows up everywhere. Uh, everything from, from meshes to graphs, point clouds, which are just big piles of points. These are what come out of LiDAR scanners and self-driving cars. Distance matrices. Um, so maybe I have a corpus of documents, was one that recently came up for us, uh, and I measure all of their pairwise similarities. Right? So that's some notion of the geometry of the space of documents. It sounds ridiculous, but it's more or less what, what people do uh, in, in some of these NLP applications. Uh, maybe there are certain data sets, and of course, uh, I would be remiss if I did not use the phrase deep network at least once in any class uh, classified as AI. Uh, and indeed, uh, uh, the output of the deep network is effectively embedding your data in a weird high dimensional space. Yeah? And that's more or less uh, the picture uh, that, that many people draw when they talk about how to train these things. So and from my perspective, what I'm going to try and encourage you guys to think about is that geometry isn't just triangles and circles, but rather nearly any object that's equipped with some notion of proximity, distance, bendiness, curvature, whatever, uh, and, and, and that developing an intuition for these problems is a pretty versatile uh, way to go. Yeah? Uh, and, and so the, the times of issues that come up uh, in this class are, are many. Um, I think the philosophical one that I would like you guys to start thinking about, and we'll address three-ish lectures from now, so here's a, here's a triangle mesh, it's a dolphin. I believe this is one, you know, there's like kind of a pantheon of famous triangle meshes out there that graphics people use, uh, and, and this is among them. Uh, so here's the thing. What is this thing? Is this a smooth surface? Well, absolutely not. Yeah? I mean, it's, it's got a bunch of facets on it. Um, so can this object have curvature? It's a really tough question to ask, right? Because if, if, you're, a, if you're a mathematician, you would probably say no, well, if you're an undergrad mathematician, you'd say no. If you're a graduate level mathematician, you'd say yes, but then give a very complicated answer that I don't want to hear about integrals. Um, <laughs> the, is it, am I wrong? Because I don't, I don't think I'm wrong. Um, okay, so, so the reality is that this object is simultaneously a lot of different things. On the one hand, it's a big pile of triangles. <laughs> There's no denying that. Yeah? But as a big pile of triangles, what is this curvature almost everywhere? I mean that in the formal sense. Zero. It's flat. Yeah? There's no curvature to be had. Yeah? So if I want to talk about the bendiness of this dolphin, I'm, I'm like hosed from ground zero here. Yeah? To make matters worse, what's the curvature at a vertex? It's like, like the frowny face emoji, right? It's, uh, there, isn't, there isn't curvature there. It's just, it's just a singular point. Uh, and so already we can see that 
the basic ideas of what we talk about in Smooth Manifold require some either adaptation, interpretation, discretization, whatever your favorite T-I-O-N word is here, uh, uh, to, in order to apply uh, uh, to this kind of a structure. At the same time, it has its own structure, right? I mean, it's perfectly legitimate on every edge to measure the dihedral angle, like the angle between these two triangles. I can measure the angle defect, like if I look at a vertex and calculate all the thetas and add them up, right? That tells me a little bit something about the geometry of this object. And so the question is, can I connect these sort of things, which in a sense actually are closer to what you probably learned in trigonometry class, to this smooth picture of the world, and what does that transition look like? Yeah? And this is a really tricky problem that has shown up time and time again in the computational world. Right, so the early approaches uh, you know, said, well, this is some approximation of a smooth cur surface, so maybe I'm going to try and approximate a bunch of curvature values. The more modern approach is to build up a theory of geometry that just works on this object from the start. Yeah? And we'll talk about both of these here. So in any event, the, the answer to uh, this question, uh, you know, can a triangle mesh have curvature, is kind of, uh, you know, like, yeah, 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 in some sense, but you've got to say what it is. Yeah? And, 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 and that's where things get interesting to me. Um, and so in order to be a research student in this kind of a discipline, you really have to be a jack of all trades, right? On the one hand, this squiggly bar here is a big pile of triangles, each of which has uh, tangents and cosines and sines and, and cotangents. We're going to see a lot of cotangents soon. Um, but at the same time, if I step back 10 feet, it's an approximation of a smooth object. And we need both of those pictures in our head at the same time in order to combine uh, into a, a, a sort of a relevant theory uh, that, that works in both cases. And this is sort of the inspiration for a research discipline, which I love, uh, called discrete differential geometry. Notice even the name is a contradiction in terms, right? Like I, 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 there's differential geometry means derivative and there's no derivatives to be had here. Um, but the basic idea of discrete differential geometry is to build up a theory of geometry with an equal sign, not like a little you know, approximation squiggly sign, from the bottom up. So we're going to talk about notions of curvature and so on that are just defined in terms of things you can measure on a triangulated surface. Uh, and then one of the interesting things is if you do that just the right way, it's also a good approximation of the smooth quantity. Right? So there's a sort of one foot in one world and one foot in another. And so a lot of times there's a lot of hot air that gets blown around in our research discipline about these two terms, which to you guys may sound the same, but actually are quite different. Uh, if you go to SIGGRAPH and you, you listen to people from certain institutions give talks, you'll see that they spend a lot of time very carefully choosing one of these or the other. So there's the discrete world, that would be like measuring angles and lengths and distances on the triangle mesh itself as a big tri pile of triangles that are glued together, right, like origami. And on the other hand, we'll talk about discretized geometry, which would say that like maybe I take a patch around every vertex, approximate it with some smooth object, and then do math on that, right? So the discrete one is the what I can do exactly, so it's a little less powerful, but I can say more about it. And the discretized one is trying to capture some of these really complicated smooth notions, but only approximately, right? So theorems in the first one tend to be like, you know, I can get the number of, the, you know, the number of holes in a donut by adding together these angles, even if it's triangulated. Whereas theorems over here tend to say like, as I increase the number of triangles, this number converges to curvature. Do you guys see the difference? And so that's a, an interesting theme, and, and, and the basic idea of discrete differential geometry, as we'll cover it in this course, is that it's a discrete theory that parallels differential geometry and builds from the ground up. And the big theme in an area like this is something called structure preservation. Yeah? And so the idea of structure preservation is that we're going to take certain notions from the smooth theory of geometry and make them hold exactly in the discrete case. So let's do a 10 second example. So let's say that I'm looking at two-dimensional curves. Two lectures from now, we'll come back to this. Uh, and, and one number you might have heard of is the winding number of a curve. It's the number of times it loops around itself. Yeah? There are many different ways to understand the winding number. Uh, we're just going to talk pictorially today, and then we'll fill in details later. Um, one way to talk about winding number, if I have a smooth curve, is to talk about the Gauss map. So let's say that I take the tangent to my curve here. right? And I think of it as a unit vector. Right? So this is just a unit length thing. And now I draw you know, a loop around my curve. 
And I look not at the path, like the position on the, the blackboard, but rather the path that the tangent vector takes. Now the tangent vector is, is a unit vector, right? So it sits on a circle. It sits here, right? So like here are the tangent points up, over here it points kind of sideways. Right? So there's like a little clock that's turning as I drive around uh, and take a lap around my, my curve here. Yeah? And what happens to the tangent vector as I go around this curve? Well, eventually, you know, I go all the way around, I get back to this point here, and it meets up with itself, right? And so I can calculate the total angle that it traveled when I did that, yeah? And that number is called the winding number of my curve, right? So for like usual curves that we're used to thinking about, the winding number is just one, right? Usually we divide by two pi, by the way. Um, uh, you know, if I have a curve like this, maybe it's plus two because it loops around itself twice. Do you guys kind of see the construction here? We'll fill in, I promise we'll do calculus and fill in detail soon. This is just a pictorial thing. So here's an idea uh, that, that, that could suggest how you might do structure preservation. Okay, so how many of us remember from high school the exterior angle theorem? Probably like rings a bell, but like as you haven't seen it, I promise you saw it in high school. That everybody has. Let me draw you a suggestive picture. Let's say that I have a polygon that isn't a square because then it's boring. <laughs> That's a polygon. This is a straight line in case you're wondering. Um, and I draw an exterior angle which is like this thing, right? So these are all exterior angles, right, at every one of the vertices. This is like one of these things that you prove when you do, you know, straight edge and compass. Um, I think math contest kids kind of like this kind of stuff. Um, what happens if I add up all of the exterior angles of a polygon? I get 360 degrees, or 2 pi. Yeah, that's a, a, a theorem from, from, from Euclidean geometry. What happens if I draw a loop and I integrate the curvature? I get 2 pi. Hmm. Right? So let's say, and, 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 and to make matters even more complicated, let's think about this exterior angle for a second. Let's say that I'm a car. You know, there's the car. And he's driving along the curve. Roughly how much curvature does he experience when he turns the steering wheel at every one of the vertices here? Well, it looks an awful lot like the exterior angle, right? When the exterior angle is zero, the car's just moving straight. Yeah? So there's some notion of curvature at this vertex here. Or if I add them all together, I get 2 pi, which looks an awful lot like this topological theorem. Yeah? So one of the things I can do is reverse engineer a measure of curvature that preserves this property exactly, that when I sum up all the curvatures, I get some number involving the number of times my, my, my curve loops around itself. Okay, so that's the thing that we're going to think about, and we're going to fill in the details in a few lectures. Okay. So this is an idea of structure preservation, uh, and that fights with a different idea called convergence. Now here's the thing, did I tell you that this has anything to do with like the change in angle of the clock face? Well, in this case, it's kind of, you can kind of guess that it should. But no, I mean, I just kind of guessed, like I, I said, oh, there's a 2 pi hiding here. <laughs> and there's a 2 pi in this other thing, let's try and make them kind of look like each other. Right? What I didn't do is show you that like if I take this polygon and I start adding more and more points to approximate some smooth curve, that this number that I'm proposing has anything to do with curvature in the differential geometry sense. And that idea is convergence, right? This is like the discretized notion of geometry. So there's a key theme here, which is can you have it all? Can you have a convergent notion of differential geometry that also preserves the interesting structure, right? That may be like a notion of curvature that integrates to 2 pi on a discrete object, but at the same time, you know, really has a, is a good second order approximation of of, of curvature in the sort of numerical sense. How many of us vote yes? How many of us vote no? How many of us are like, I don't know what I'm doing in this class. This, yeah. uh, right, no, so un un unfortunately for us, uh, like we already kind of alluded to earlier, um, the answer is no. Uh, that oftentimes what you'll do is you'll come up with a list of all of your favorite smooth properties of some object. For example, for curvature, maybe, you know, the integral of curvature tells you the winding number. Curvature also tells you something about gradient descent on arc length. We'll show that on your homework. Um, and we'll say, I want a notion of curvature that preserves all of these things, but works on a smooth, uh, discrete object. And then what you prove is that that doesn't exist. Yeah? Uh, so, for example, here, we'll talk about Laplace operators later. Uh, and you can see that we present a natural 
uh, list of natural properties for Laplace operators on triangle meshes. We improve an important theoretical limitation. Discrete Laplacians cannot satisfy all of the natural properties. Yeah? And so unfortunately, while people get really excited about structure preservation, it, it actually prevents you uh, from having other structure preser preservation. In other words, for every one smooth object, there's a whole zoo of discrete objects to choose from, depending on what structure you care about. Yeah, so it could be, if you're a physical simulation guy, the structure you want to preserve is quite different from, from you know, what you want if you're doing like, computer-aided design. This is an interesting kind of non-obvious theme in, in the geometry world that'll come up quite a bit. Yes? Is that just like information loss? I don't think it's information loss in the sense that, like, what it's saying is that if I take Oh, yeah, it's, that's a good question. I, I wouldn't call it an information fact. I would say it's more like uh, somehow the way that we define a lot of these things from differential geometry involves derivatives. We don't have those here. Um, so somehow we're working in the, the analogous world and there's some finite things that when you have infinite amounts of little bits of wiggle room, you can squeeze all in, but you, but you don't get in, in the discrete case. That's an extremely fuzzy explanation. <laughs> Essentially, I'm punting right now. Uh, yes? <laughs> what was that? It's not always convergence. So for example, in this paper, uh, the properties include positive definite matrix. Uh, I think, um, what is this property of, of uh, PDE, where if I average stuff, I end up in the middle, like a maximum principle. Uh, just like sort of basic stuff that you, you expect to be true. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's quite surprising. Um, yeah, and so the theme is that actually there's room to be an engineer here. You have to pick and choose the properties that you need, uh, and, and, and that means you need to know your application. Um, but luckily there's a big toolbox of cool stuff to draw from. I'm uh, already low on time because I get all hot and bothered and excited about these, these topics in geometry. Uh, but, but roughly uh, some of the, the fun things that we'll include uh, you know, in our discussion include some numerical methods for differential equations like heat flow and smoothing and so on, um, actually get applied in geometric applications. So here we see, what, uh, not Zeus, what's this guy's name? Poseidon floating, flowing to a, a skeleton, and this comes from uh, mean curvature flow. Uh, there's smooth optimization, which is going to allow us to map cows to uh, rugs. So here, you know, if you've taken uh, <laughs> optimization in uh, machine learning class, these are exactly the same techniques here. Um, but if you think about this as an optimization problem, it's quite difficult, right? What are your variables? It's the position of every single vertex on this cow in the plane. It's actually a very large scale optimization problem. And if any two triangles share the same piece of the plane, this is a completely useless parameterization for an artist, right? Because they can't store it, you know, a cow texture here and put it there because two points in the cow will get the same texture. You know? So this is extremely constrained, nonlinear. Uh, problem uh, that, that comes up in a pretty innocent looking application. Yeah? Um, we'll talk a little bit about some discrete problems, like here uh, in, in meshing, uh, oftentimes you end up not only you know, having a smooth surface, but having to approximate it with a bunch of little building blocks. So there's some interface between the differential structure there and the kind of little discrete tiles that you want to put on it at the end of the day. Uh, and of course you can't escape things like linear algebra. Um, so we'll see the starting in our next lecture, I don't think I'll have time today, uh, we'll see eigenvalues, least squares, all of our favorite things uh, come up over and over again. So if you were looking for a good application, you'll find it. Uh, of course, uh, one of the fun things we can do, I suppose it's not surprising now that people talk about what recurrent networks and so on. Uh, one of the fun things geometry people do is they say, okay, well, geometry is great, so let's have some geometry on our geometry. Uh, and they'll look at things like the space of shapes and then put a geometry on that. Right? So think about, uh, let's say that I have this animated character. There's this data set of all of these guys in these little like uncomfortable clothing that, that I have to spend a lot of time looking at. But in any event, these are points in very high dimensional space, right? These are configuration of some triangulated mesh, which has 10,000 vertices, right? So that means that I, these are really points in R to the 30,000, right? X, Y, Z for every single vertex on this triangle mesh. And there's a geometry sitting there, right? Because as he traces out an animation, right, that's some path in that high dimensional space, and some paths are much more likely than others, right? And so one of the cool things that people do is they say, well, now that we've developed a notion of geometry, let's apply it to put a notion of geometry on the space of geometries. Uh, and that's actually used uh, for, for problems like uh, animation. So here, there's some keyframes of this person moving around, and then they're using it for in-betweening uh, to kind of uh, transition between them.
Uh, we'll talk maybe very briefly toward the end of this class with some applications and representation theory, like groups and quotients and so on. I already mentioned SO3, right? The space of rotations comes up a lot in robotics. Uh, quotients of those groups come up as well. Here's an image from my own research. Uh, well, not my own, but with, of course, many colleagues uh, here at MIT, where we talk a lot about the quotient of SO3, like the set of rotations, in this case, by the symmetries of a cube, right? Because if I take a cube and rotate it 90 degrees, it's the same cube. Uh, and that has certain sort of implications for how we can uh, do things like extract mesh structures and volumes and so on. And then very quickly, we'll, we'll mention some of the many applications. I think we've already seen these today anyway. Um, but all this is just to say that these aren't just fun theoretical tools, but they show up everywhere in computation. Right? That's our goal, really, is to bring all these ideas together. Right? And so uh, some of the obvious places we see these uh, uh, geometry tools being used include uh, computer graphics, right? everything from editing, retrieval of, 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 of surfaces to maybe transferring texture, like I want to put a terracotta or whatever this is, marble texture, transfer it from a vase to a bunny. Um, of course, I can kind of do that, but these two objects have very different geometry, right? And, and, and so tiling that in a smooth way uh, is actually quite challenging. Um, they show up in computer vision, right? Automatic uh, navigation, recognition, and so on. Often the basic input data that you have is a shape and nothing more. Uh, and in this case, I would argue that there's a lot of room for improvement beyond uh, the convolutional neural network we see in the 2D vision world, right? In particular, a shape is a very thin slice that sits in 3D, uh, and it's not clear that just a giant volume of, of like inside and outside, you know, ones and zeros is really the best way to understand a shape. In fact, some of the most interesting open research problems are hiding here. Uh, another community that actually has some of the most sophisticated uh, tools, is, is, is uh, geometrically speaking, is in medical imaging. They have some really beautiful uh, techniques for registration and lining surfaces, analyzing them, looking at how signals move along a surface, like tracking your, you, you know, the electrical circuits in your brain, or looking at the white matter and how it connects the uh, the gray matter on the outside. Um, one that geometry processing people love is manufacturing and fabrication. Of course, that's a big focus of research here at MIT. Uh, and the reality is, if you 3D print something, it's a shape. Yeah? Uh, and, and, and <laughs> I know, so this is a pew. Uh, and uh, you, you know, if you want to have intelligent algorithms for, for, for processing these things, it's exactly the tools we'll talk about here. Some other fun ones include architecture. I love architectural geometry because these people aren't constrained by things like making real shapes. They just make whatever's cool looking. Uh, and so like you get these examples in architectural geometry, you know, papers like this thing which I think stands up by itself despite having a million holes and being weird looking. Um, you know, interesting objects with topology and windows tiled together in cool ways and so on. Uh, toward the end of this class, we'll talk about collections of shapes, uh, which is a great kind of machine learning application. Right? How do I take not just one teddy bear, but a whole set of them and automatically process them and, and know where their differences and similarities are? Uh, and hiding inside of there are problems like correspondence. Right? So uh, people in medical imaging care a lot about, you know, I have, uh, you know, there's a 3D model of my brain, there's a 3D model of Sebastian's brain, they have some structure in common, but probably not too much. Uh, is much smarter than I am, uh, and, and identifying those, those differences explicitly uh, in an automatic fashion uh, is, is a, sort of a key challenge problem in, in that world. Other places to look may be, you know, I have Sofian and I want to transfer him onto a GUI uh, uh, deforming ghost model. Um, in your first homework, you'll talk about simulation, uh, and, and in particular, you're, you're going to implement the first step towards simulating shoelaces, which is obviously a critical uh, problem in the geometry world. Shoelace geometry is quite challenging. You know this? If you take the ends of a shoelace and you, you bend it, and uh, what happens? Well, eventually it buckles in the middle, right? Anybody know what that buckle is called? It's called a plectoneme. You can take that to, to bar trivia. Uh, and in case that wasn't enough uh, bar trivia, here uh, is uh, somebody has taken a, a honey, like, you know, the little bear with the hole in his head, and then they, <laughs> I think they put it on their treadmill, literally, <laughs> like, the, you know, the, and, and, and looked at the pattern that it traces out. Honey is a great example of something that's neither a fluid nor a piece of string, but something halfway in between, <laughs> right? And so what happens is the honey falls on the honey treadmill, and it traces out these beautiful patterns, because for a little while, it, it acts like a piece of string, and then it glues onto itself uh, as the, the treadmill uh, it starts moving, right? And there's actually some beautiful theory uh, that predicts, like, do you get a loop or a wave or what? And it depends on the 
speed of the treadmill and the honeyness of your honey and, and all of that good stuff. And actually the uh, elastic rods that you'll implement on your first homework uh, is the first step towards simulating honey treadmills. It's really why you're all here. Uh, uh, geometric tools show up in scientific visualization. This is no big surprise. Um, here's a visualization of orbitals of some damn thing or another. I'm not a f physicist, <laughs> but I encourage you to take a look at this page to see what these guys are doing. Um, it appears in medical image segmentation uh, and, and then in, in some interesting applications in high dimensional problems as well. So for instance, let's say we have the social network of all the people in this room. Uh, and I make an assumption, which is that I tend to be friends with people with a similar, I don't know, income to myself. It's true, I, I have a very specific, you know, bracket. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> right, so maybe I have the entire social network, uh, and on a few nodes, right, because Facebook has all kinds of creepy data collection, they know, you know, your social security number and your, your, your income and all of that good stuff. And then, you know, because they want to know even more, they want to know the income of your friends. Well, okay, so there's a geometric structure hiding there, right, in this case, the social network. And on a few of the nodes, there's a little bit of additional information. And the semi-supervised learning problem asks, can I propagate that data to the rest of my data set? And once again, this becomes kind of a geometric problem, right? I have some geometric figure, in this case, represented by the graph of relationships. I have a few labels per nodes, and I make an assumption that information diffuses outward. There's our, our kind of geometric term. Uh, and, and what we'll see, which is kind of neat, is exactly the tools that we're going to use for shape retrieval, literally without a change in the line of code, Actually, we're really sneaky. Maybe we can do that on the homework. Uh, uh, we'll solve some of these, these semi-supervised uh, uh, semi learning problems. You can you know, predict the income of your friends. You should probably use your ways to do that. Uh, right, and of course, uh, people in statistics talk about this quite a bit. A lot of the statistical theories that you probably learned in, in undergrad had hiding in there a dimension number, right? Like you have data points in Rn, and there's like an n hiding in your theorem. And that seems innocent enough, but oftentimes we have very high dimensional data. Uh, and then these theorems become very useless because of assorted kind of concentration issues that like proximity and, and notions of closeness get really weird in high dimensions and are hard to think about. One way to counteract that is to additionally sort of observe that, yeah, my data is sitting in a high dimensional space, but really it's kind of a low dimensional object. Right? Many of you have probably seen principal component analysis as a simple example of that. Uh, and and, and uh, this actually does two things. One is help with statistics. Another, uh, which I've been doing a little bit of reading on, so I might throw it into our, our, our class, uh, is if you're an algorithms person, it gives you better lower bounds on, on certain uh, uh, techniques. Right? Because there's some geometry problems involving, uh, you know, kind of taking space and dividing it into different partitions and so on that scale poorly uh, in dimensionality. But if you know a little bit about where your data lives, you can do better. Okay? So with that, I think I have, if nothing else, communicated my enthusiasm for this research area to all of you guys. Uh, starting in our next lecture, I promise we're going to do math. Uh, so in the meantime, what you guys need to do is just take a quick look at your homework. Uh, the first couple problems are already uh, doable with your background, but again, the notation is designed to be irritating and frightening. So don't be frightened. Come talk to us to get help. Uh, and I'm hoping to see all of your smiling uh, faces on <laughs> whatever there on, 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 on Thursday, okay? So it was a pleasure, and I'll, I'll see you then. In the meantime, we have a few minutes for questions if you, if you have any. Now let me turn this off so we don't have a hot mic.